Hello YouTube and welcome back to this Axis and Allies 1914 tutorial series. For this video, there are a couple topics that I want to go over. I'd like to talk a little bit more about naval bases, and then I want to talk about capturing capitals. What does that mean? And then that's going to lead into a discussion of how do you actually win this game of Axis and Allies 1914. Now that is going to be winning according to the official rules in the book. Of course, if you are playing with your friends, you could come up with different conditions, or you could just uh, declare one side the winner when you're tired of playing or when one side decides to concede. But we're going to be looking at specifically what does the rule book say you have to do in order to win the game. So those are going to be our topics. Let's jump into it. So naval bases. How do you know if if there's a naval base present? Well, there's going to be a little symbol, little anchor symbol right there. Um, and you see there are a couple spots just up here. Um, they are scattered throughout the board. And that means a couple things. So one, that means that uh, that power, so in this case England, if we're looking right there, uh, that one up in Kiel or in Berlin would be Germany. That means that that power, when it is... Uh, putting down new units, it's purchased units, uh, now it gets to put them down, it can put naval units in those sea zones. So the port is right there on the land, this sea zone right here, sea zone 9, England could put uh, naval units there. Um, when it comes to land units, they must be placed in the capital, except in the case of British India, England can put stuff there. But in all other cases, you must put land units in the capital. Well, for naval forces, you can put them in any of your, um, in any of the sea zones that are adjacent to one of your starting uh, seaports. Now the seaport also uh, mines uh, places sea mines in that territory. So uh, if you are, if it's a friendly seaport, you don't have to worry about it. So like the U.S. Navy right here, they can move through here no problem. Basically, gets to ignore that uh, completely. Uh, and then we've got this other force up here. So if, but if this force wanted to move down here, um, and maybe through this way, this is a German uh, German mine territory. So they're going to have to roll for sea mines, and we're going to talk about that here in just a second. What does that mean? Now, uh, there are variations of these rules. Sometimes you have to stop if you get into a uh, territory that's mine, that has enemy sea mines. However, the actual book rules do not mention that. So the actual book rules, uh, this British fleet could come in here, roll for sea mines, and then continue to move, uh, try to attack this German fleet over here, provided the American fleet still has enough movement. And we know that uh, all naval units can move at least two spaces, cruisers can move three, so this fleet should be able to make it here. This fleet down here, um, the cruiser would be able to get there because it's one, two, three, but the uh, any other ships down there would not. That battleship, that transport would not be able to do it. So what does it mean uh, to have to roll for sea mines? Well, so let's say that we've got this American fleet, we've got a battleship, a sub, and a transport, and it moves into here. Well, before it can move on, we have to see if it gets struck by enemy sea mines. So Germany is going to take its dice, and it's going to roll one die for each enemy ship involved, and for every one that is rolled, that is a hit on a, with a sea mine. Now, because there are multiple ships here, I would recommend that Germany call out what it's rolling for. That way, the American player doesn't get to decide um, how it wants to distribute those. It's probably going to want to take one of them on the battleship uh, and keep the other ships around. So um, I would recommend that Germany uh, distinguish, okay, this die is going to be for the battleship, this one is going to be for the sub, this one's going to be for the transport. And um, for all units in this game, except for battleships, we know that a single hit causes them to be removed. So a single mine hit on this, that sub, for example, that sub is going to be gone. Um, however, if the battleship gets hit, you just act as if it was hit one time in combat, and then, then it keeps going because battleships have to be hit twice to be sunk. One other thing that the seaport does 
if you have your uh, damage battleship in that seaport uh, for a turn, basically, um, then it can be repaired. And basically, that means if it's been hit once, um, then it goes back to being fully repaired and now it has to be hit twice again to be sunk. It's as if the first hit uh, didn't matter. So we talked about the American fleet. What if the German fleet wants to move out just as an illustration? Well, it could move here and this is mined by Germany so they don't have to worry about it. And then if they moved here, they would have to roll for British sea mines. Um, if uh, the U.S. came in here, they'd roll once for these sea mines, and then if they wanted to keep going, they'd roll again for sea mines. And then, with whatever's left, they could engage uh, the German fleet in combat, right there. Now, how do naval bases change hands? Um, and what does that mean for sea mines? Well, if the original uh, country, so let's say Germany, for example, controls Kiel, then of course this is considered to be mined by Germany. If Kiel is contested, so maybe uh, France has some units up there and Germany and France are fighting over it, this is still considered mined by Germany. It only changes if the territory involved with the seaport has been taken, uh, the opposing forces have, the opposing alliance has taken control of that territory. If it's in the original owner's hands, or even if it's contested, that sea zone is still considered to be mined um, by the by the enemy there, by the original controller of that territory. So that is how naval bases work in this game. Now, now let's move on to the next topic, and that's going to be capital. So we know, of course, that every country has a capital, and that's where we put our land units. Uh, let's use France as an example. So let's say that Germany has been marching into here, into France, and Germany eventually takes control of Paris. Well, what that's going to mean is that any income that France has is going to be handed over to Germany. And we know that uh, nations collect income at the end of their turn, so chances are that that country is probably going to have a fair amount of cash on hand. So all of that money gets handed over to the country that took over the capital. So if Germany takes over Paris, then Germany gets the money. If Austria-Hungary takes Paris, then Austria-Hungary gets the money. And then just like any other territory, uh, the country that took it over also gets its, their production increased. In this case, it'd be by six, uh, by the production uh, value of that territory. And so it's a, it's a nice... Uh, usually a, a significant influx of cash, but then you also have that recurring uh, money. The country that has lost their capital also is not able to collect any additional income. They are still in the game, provided they have forces on the board. Um, they can continue to move those forces around no problem, but they don't collect any income, and because they have no capital, they also cannot uh, place any units. I mean, they have no money to spend on it, but basically they can't bring in money and they can't place any new units. So they're very quickly going to get whittled down unless they have an ally that comes in to liberate their capital. Now, when the capital is liberated, if it is liberated, they don't get all of that money back. Like Germany wouldn't have to leave France's money off in a pile somewhere and then give it back if, let's say, England takes uh, Paris back and liberates it. Um, Germany can spend that money um, on its turn, as if it were its own. But if uh, if England liberates Paris, that or any ally liberates Paris, then France can start collecting money again and can start producing uh, units. In order to win the game, uh, it does that does have to do with capitals. So for the allies to win the game, they must control two central powered capitals, one of which must be Berlin. So that means that if you capture Berlin and Vienna as the allies, you win. Berlin and Constantinople, you win. However, if you capture Vienna and Constantinople and Berlin is still under central power control, you do not win. One of those capitals must be Berlin. Now, if you are the Central powers, how do you win? Well, it's a similar idea. You need two enemy capitals, but in this case, one of them has to either be Paris or London. 
So you could win by taking Rome and Paris. You could win by taking Moscow and uh, London. You could win by taking London and Paris. But you could not win by taking Rome and Moscow. Or by taking Washington, D.C. and Rome. Though if you're taking Washington, D.C., um, you're there's something really crazy going on, and you probably have the game uh, under your control. But um, according to the official rules, you must control two enemy capitals. Uh, if you're the central powers, one of those capitals has to either be London or Paris. It doesn't have to be both. Um, but one of those must be among the two that you control. If you are the allies or the Entente, you also must control two capitals, one of which is Berlin. There is no either or there. Um, except uh, Berlin and then either of the other two. Um, but it's not like London or Paris must be uh, one, of the, one of the special ones that you conquer. Um, it must be Berlin. So uh, that's where we're going to wrap up this video. It's a little bit shorter, a couple different uh, topics. Um, I do plan on having another video or two in this tutorial series uh, just to talk about some additional rules uh, Russian Revolution, unrestricted submarine warfare, things like that. Um, but that is uh, how you win the game. So now you basically know about each country, you know about the different uh, mechanics, you know about uh, the economy, how you, how you uh, get more money, how you get more units, how you use those units in combat, and what is your final goal. Uh, how are you aligning all of your strategic efforts so that you can uh, hopefully win the game for your alliance.